happened? Brother Billy, like five people are just not even going to drive to church. They're just going to levitate over here. And there's going to be some that's going to walk on the water. And you just believe that, that everything has just clicked together and the Holy Ghost has already uh, prepared everybody. But I find out that often that's not the case. Very often when you, when you, you know, really feel like you've got something from the Lord, uh, it's, it's often a struggle. And... Uh, uh, not to say that we struggled this morning, but if you're, you've not ever been here before, uh, you definitely need to come back because we can, we can throw down. Amen? Uh, but it's, it's not about putting on a show or anything. It's just about responding to the Holy Ghost, to the Spirit of God and what you feel in you. Uh, I, I feel like I've got something this morning. Like I said, I, I've probably, I don't know how many hours I could teach off of this or preach or, you know, you know how it is. But uh, uh, I, uh, I'm super excited about what the Lord is doing because there's every prayer meeting that I have, every time I come in and pray and seek in the Lord's face to minister, uh, I, uh, I get distracted. Not not necessarily by my own scatterbrainness, though that is a distinct possibility, uh, but I get distracted because as I begin to pray for you, I realize that every week, every week, a new issue crops up with somebody different. And as I begin to seek after the Lord and I begin to pray, uh, my prayer is, Lord, help me fix it. You understand that we're not looking to, to feel better. We want fixed. You know, I mean, you, you can get lost in a, in a bottle of Mad Dog 2020 and feel better for a little while, huh? But we, we're looking for a fix. We want to be changed. I, I don't want to wrestle with these problems anymore. And I, I don't want to uh, continually. I'm ready for some people to begin to, to, to put on the whole armor of God, as it were, and, and fight a good fight of faith going forward, rather than try to fix all the stuff that we're still dragging from behind us. Amen? And I feel like, I feel like that much of what we battle with and much of what we struggle with is a matter of perception rather than reality. It's how do you perceive things? Because I perceive, I have been perceiving that the two or three that has morphed into 30 or 40 people that are really battling life-altering things I have perceived that the solution is to get out of it, to get out of this problem, to get out of this place. You know, uh, the, I, I want to be pulled out. I want to be lifted up. We even preached last Sunday morning about being hung up in the pit and being pulled out. But I come to the realization of a, of a powerful revelation that I'm going to share with you this morning by the help of the Lord. Isaiah 12 and 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Matthew Henry says, and that's a famous commentary, Bible commentary from back in the 1800s. Matthew Henry says, None can truly perceive how precious Christ is and the glory of the gospel except the brokenhearted. Nobody can truly embrace how precious Jesus is and how valued and how treasured he is and the glory and the beauty of his gospel except the brokenhearted. Sister Janice Joe Strand, who is one of our pastor's wives and a minister in her own right. 
I listened to her song. Sister Stacy has sung at C.C. Winans, won a Dove Award, maybe a Grammy Award. I'm not for sure with it, the Alabaster Box. But Sister Joe Strand has a line in that song that not necessarily had fame brought to it. But it says, you don't know what I've been through to bring me to this place of praise he brought me to. From the revelation of himself to Moses at the burning bush, which if you were fortunate enough to go to Sunday school, no doubt you've learned that Moses was ostracized from Egypt where he'd been raised a royal and ended up killing a guy and buried him in the sand. And he ran away, Brother David, and hid for 40 years on the backside of the desert. But one day while he's tending sheep, he notices a bush catches on fire. And yet it is not being burned up. It's simply burning, but not consumed, the Bible says. And the Lord spoke that Moses through the burning bush. And he said, you're going to go get my people out of Egypt, for their cries come up before me. After a, a lengthy debate and a lengthy uh, a discussion about uh, Moses' qualifications or lack thereof, he finally says, okay, whose authority am I going under? Who do I tell them sent me? And uh, uh, I have to confess to you, when I heard this in Sunday school, I didn't quite understand it. Because the Lord spoke to Moses and said, tell him, I am that I am has sent you. I didn't really comprehend it. I have to confess to you. I could have thought, you know, uh, 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 there's a lot more tougher sounding names than I am. Right? You know, ain't nobody in the WWF or WWE going around saying I'm the I am. That ain't all that tough sounding. Ain't all that cool sounding. What does it even fit? But I realized as I grew older that from the burning bush up through and including today, he is forever the I am. He will never be the I used to be, nor will he ever be the I will be, but he is forever the I am. Wherever you are, whatever you've become, whatever trials or struggles you're going through, he is the I am. He is not intimidated by your circumstances. He's not searching for a way to try to help you because he is the way. He is the everything. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the root and the offspring of Jesse. He is the line of the tribe of Judah. He is the lamb for sinners slain. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily of the valley. He is the bride and the morning star. Whatever you need, whatever I need, whatever the world needs, he is the I am for that situation. Unfortunately for us, it's not him that we need to worry about. Nobody ever needs to worry about God or what he can do or what he's being faced with. Don't worry about God in the midst of a perverse generation and crooked, the Bible says, that we live in. Don't, don't be worried about God. He's not intimidated. He's not uh, distressed. He's not, uh, he's not sitting up there fanning himself and, and saying, fellas, let's find out something to do. Brother David, he always has a plan for salvation. And it always involves us acknowledging him as the I am. But he's, he's not the one we need to worry about. The one I need to worry about is me. Wednesday nights. And I'm so grateful for the, the great number of folks that come out. But we've started a series on praying through the tabernacle. And it is a pattern of prayer in which you start at the place the high priest starting and you end up at the place the high priest ended up which is starting point the gate ending point is the holy of holies and you're going to find that at the gate we worship the Lord we give thanks and praise to him but at the altar the laver little bit at the door and the golden candlestick we are primarily dealing with us your prayers your desires your effectiveness hinges on you not on him he is what he is Luke chapter 7 verse 36 
And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Now typically, you read, that are very familiar with the Bible, the Pharisees usually only had two goals when it came to Jesus Christ. They would shun him or they would try to discredit him. So there was a certain sense of validation in Jesus Christ. There was a certain sense of accomplishment to the man Christ Jesus and no doubt to his disciples and those that followed him. Because Jesus was invited to eat with a Pharisee. Now we who manage to, pardon the crude expression, have our snout in the trough more times than not. Eat here, eat there. When I travel sometimes, I'll stop at one overpass and eat lunch and stop at the next overpass and get ice cream. We do not fully understand what it meant in their society to sit down and eat with somebody. You remember the times, what proves it more? The times when Jesus Christ would sit down and eat with sinners. The Pharisees would ridicule him and they would demean him and they would in fact invalidate him and not take him seriously because you were considered in that day to be equivalent of who you sat down and ate with. So there was a, a manner of speaking that Jesus Christ was being validated by the, by the very ones who ended up being his worst enemy and quite frankly, Brother David, play a huge role in his crucifixion. But when they invite him over, you remember in, the, in the, uh, uh, John chapter number 3 that Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, who was a religious authority, he came to see Jesus by sneaking in at the night time, Brother Pete. But now there's a Pharisee who in broad daylight has invited Jesus to come and sit at his table. So to some degree, Simon the Pharisee believed that Jesus was who he claimed to be. Because he invited him to eat. He invited him as a guest into his home. Not as a slave, not as a servant. Not even apparently as a, you know, a matter of, of charity or benevolence. But he invited him as an equal to come and sit at his table. Verse 38. And behold, a woman in the city. I'm sorry. I've got my numbers, Caddy Wampus. You were right. 37. And behold, a woman in the city. All of the women in the house, raise your hand. There you go. Please, I mean no disrespect, but this could be you. Or if you want to receive the word of the Lord today as God intends it, it could be any one of us. Behold a woman in the city, which was a sinner. That's quite probable that this, this description is referencing her reputation rather than specific sinful acts. It's probably not anything she's doing right that minute. But you're going to see in a few minutes, it's quite possible that she is well known for her reputation as a sinner. When she knew that Jesus said it meet in the Pharisee's house, which lends itself to the purposefulness of her actions. This was not a random occurrence. This was not a Jesus just happened to be passing by, but this is when she realized and knew, I can find Jesus here. Please understand and receive the, the uh, 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 importance or, or the, uh, the, the integrity of that statement with regard to the house of God. We have got to always embrace, uh, accept, uh, and, and gladly uh, 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 grab a hold of the responsibility that when people come to this place, uh, they are expecting to run into Jesus when they get here. The Bible says she brought an alabaster box of ointment. She knew Jesus was there. 
that she brought an alabaster box of ointment. Knowing he was there and bringing the ointment denotes a declaration of her purpose. Everybody say purpose. Have we stopped long enough today? Have we stopped long enough just today? I know some of you have probably been in church a thousand times in your life. Some of you, this may be your very first day you've ever been here. But have you stopped? Anybody in the house just stopped and said, Why am I here today? Why am I here today? Do I have a purpose in coming to the house of God today? Well, I know why, why we go to church as a matter of habit. We're Christians. And in some people's thinking, that's all it means to be a Christian is you go to church. This is what we do on Sundays. I agree there's some credibility to that. But the truth of the matter is, why are you here? Why are you here today? Who, who has even thought, why am I here? Now, it's not a stretch that that lady was at the Pharisee's house because she desired an encounter with Jesus Christ. She came prepared to meet him. She didn't say, oh, you mean Jesus is there? Let me hurry up and go home and get my box and get my stuff and then I'll, I'll just take advantage of a random opportunity. She came with purpose. She came with purpose. She was there for no other reason than she desired a meeting with Jesus. The Bible says, and she stood at his feet. Next verse, there you go. Behind him, weeping. Now, I'm not going to show you how to do it. Because I'm not sure I can get back up. Nor how embarrassing it may be to try to get back up. But they would typically lay on their left elbow like this or like this. And their feet would incline out to their right. And they would all be gathered around the table in such a manner with their feet sort of behind them. At least according to one or more than one commentator. And the Bible says, and she stood there weeping. How long has it been since you have approached Jesus weeping? Rather than it be a response to what you've got from him. And the Bible says, and I want you to please play coat. Pay close attention to what I'm about to share with you. I've been, I've been rat holing this. And quite honestly, I had, forgot the, I had forgotten the, the nuances of it. I just remember the demonstration. But the Bible says, and she began to wash his feet with her tears. Has that ever perplexed anybody besides me? Do you understand how much you have to cry? How much you have to weep to be able to wash somebody's feet with your tears? Now, it's been my experience, I don't know about you, but it's been my experience that after weeping for a while, you still cry, but you'll be all cried out. The tears tend to dry up. Is that not some of your experiences as well? So, Brother Manning, I've always tried to figure out, I've tried to picture... You know, her, her standing over top of him, Sister Maria, and getting enough tears to be able to wash his feet. Anybody else ever thought about that before? How, how did that happen? Uh, you know, uh, she showered his feet with tears. How did that happen? How many tears would she have to shed in order to be able to wash Jesus' feet with her tears? Now, I would argue with you today that washing his feet was not happenstance, but it's what she showed up to do. So she would have come prepared to wash his feet. A very lovely man, a Jew, raised in India, in Bombay, 
as a result of the dispersion and return sometime after 1948 when Israel was once again declared a country his name is Abraham Hillel H-I-L-L-E-L which is in fact a form of hallelujah he was a little short wiry man that if I ever get with my wife and help her put it together you'll see him in many of the pictures that were taken when I was in Israel but we were at a particular place when he began to discuss this lady and he demonstrated to us of course the Bible does not say this emphatically but he demonstrated to us how this could have taken place where she could wash his feet with her tears the Jews would as a matter of habit they would in times of weeping, in times of suffering, in times of despair, they would take a small wine skin and as they wept, Brother David, they would hold it up under their eyes and they would catch those tears in a wine skin and they would save them, wrap them up and save them as a way of preserving a record of their suffering. Now this is not a, a concept that's foreign to scripture because in fact Psalms 56 and 8 the psalmist declares to the Lord you have put my tears in a bottle and written my sufferings on a scroll. So it was a, a way of, of, uh, of preserving a memorial of their suffering. As I was praying for this message I asked the Lord and I asked myself how do I put into words the passion with which this woman must have been consumed when she came to Jesus? The thought and the effort and the weighing as we understand later on the value not only of the alabaster box but the value of her small wine skin full of tears, what it represented to her. How do I put into words the passion with which she came to Jesus? I wrote that question down on a legal pad on my desk and if you saw in there this morning you would see tons of scribbles and arrows and lines and what have you as I begin to try to, to iron out the details if you please of this message. So I wrote the question down and I continued my preparation but I want to remind you again the question is how do I share with these precious people that's you what this was going on in this lady when she came to Jesus. How do I share it? Later in my studies, a strong impression came to me, no doubt under the influence of the Lord God Almighty, because I'm racking my brain, boy, I, I, can, I can find this word, and I can say it this way, and, and I, I can, I can uh, uh, how many of you have ever read Lewis Lamar books? Anybody? If you haven't, you don't know what you're missing. They're great. And, and, and I've told you this before. I've, I've, I've spoken of it before, Brother Billy, that, that the, but old Louie can, can be writing a story of, of, a, of a man up in the Aspens and, and, the, and the, the snowflakes begin to fall, Brother Chris. And, and if you're not careful, you'll get cold. Because he paints such a picture. And, and that's kind of what I want to do this morning. Because I know so many people are battling so many things. And, and I know that if I could just share with you what she felt and what provoked her and promoted her, then you'd do the same thing and everything be fixed. But while I'm studying, while I'm preparing, while I'm thinking and praying, impression came to me I can't put it into words and I in fact cannot express it in any manner simply because I did not experience the struggle and the pain that she felt that brought her there I'd like to be able to tell you but it's unfair brother David it's, it's not fair for me to minimize and put into a even a word picture to express what God have mercy I feel the Holy Ghost right now to put into words what this lady went through to bring her to the place she was we like to trivialize things and, and we like to divine things and as I said put them in a box but the truth of the matter is nobody on this earth knows I learned when my dad died and I use it quite often at the funeral home or when I'm preaching a message. 
I learned I never, never tell anybody I know how you feel. Never. Never. Because I don't. Nobody on this earth knew what my dad meant to me. And I realized that when he was gone. Sister Leanne, there's not a way to put it into words. And nor is there a way to put into words what this lady endured. What she went through. What that bag full of tears, if you will, represented. And especially what that box of ointment represented to her. There's no way for me to put it into words. According to my friend Abraham, this is how she would have washed his feet. She would have taken her bag of tears and she would have unwrapped it and she would have poured it out on his feet. And it wasn't just dirt she was removing, but she was in fact pouring out a record of her suffering of her struggles, of her shame, of her indignities, and all the things of her life, the things that brought her to this place, where she willingly, willingly, with the reputation of an of a, 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 a irreverent woman, that she willingly made herself vulnerable by being interloping into the Pharisees' guest chamber where Jesus was eaten. She subjected herself to the ridicule of people and to the, to the validation of her reputation. Because she was propelled. She was pushed. She was drawn. Not by people. Not even by Jesus himself. But by what she had been through. And when she opened up that bag and ends up breaking open that box... She was in effect, Brother David, I remember you teaching us. She was in effect doing spiritually what Cortez's army did when they landed at Florida. And they came to the United States of America. And as they got in, they turned around and saw Cortez had set fire to all of their ships. Because it's a clear declaration as she poured herself out on him. I've come to the end of the line. And there's no going back. I've been, I've been carrying this bag around with me. And when I frown and somebody says, what's going on? I hold it up to them and say, let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about my problems. Let me tell you about my struggles. Let me tell you about what these tears represent. But when she knelt at the feet of Jesus or stood at the feet of Jesus, she washed his feet with her tears placing herself in an extremely vulnerable position, reputation and all, simply to express her estimation of Jesus Christ. How much stuff are you carrying around that you use to validate your poor behavior? That you use to give an excuse for, the, for a lack of commitment? Maybe it's something from when you were a child. I, I spoke this a couple of weeks ago. There are people that are carrying things around that you want to keep a hold of because they allow you to stay who you are. But I, I'm, I'm introducing you to a woman today who did not want to stay there. That symbol of her suffering no longer mattered to her as much as getting to Jesus. Then the Bible says after pouring her tears out on his feet, she dried his feet with her hair. With few exceptions, the commentaries that I read looking for, looking for answers use 1 Corinthians 11 as a reference for this, in which the long uncut hair of a woman is declared to be her glory. It was her glory that she used to wash the feet of Jesus. And then the Bible says, she anointed them with the ointment. We cannot move forward without recognizing her purpose. She came armed. She came armed to do something for Jesus. She came prepared. Her box and possibly her bottle of tears, you know, and her hair with the express purpose of honoring Jesus Christ. 
Not only must we picture the physical picture of it as Simon saw, but we also have to picture her faith. What did it mean that she brought everything and with no provocation and no invitation, she poured herself completely uninvited on Jesus Christ? We get called up, man, come go to church with me. Come go to church with me. Come go to church with me. I'm in a 